Uh, please turn with me in your uh, Bible this evening to 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We're talking this evening about the attributes of God's love. An attribute is a quality. It's a characteristic of something. An attribute helps us to better understand something. It, it gives us meaning. Um, if you're sitting here tonight and you hear um, out in the parking lot barking, uh, you don't think horse. You don't think cow. Barking is an attribute of a dog. So we're going to see tonight how love is that attribute, that quality, that characteristic of who God is to us. The Bible says a great deal uh, about love. Love as a word just in and of itself in the New King James translation is used 361 times. Now that doesn't include all the other ways in, in which it's used, loveth loving, uh, but just the word love itself is there almost 400 times. I, I think that's important to notice. We understand, I think you and I, we understand what love is and what love is not. We, we become conditioned to things that we understand are good qualities of love. And, and we use love in, in many different ways. I, I love this book. Um, I love my favorite sports team, fill in the blank. Oh, I love this sunset, or I love this thing over here. I love my children. I, I love my spouse. I love my home. Uh, we are expressive when it comes to things that we love. So we have this working understanding. We, we know love. And we associate love, a love that is based on godly principles. We associate love with the understanding that it's always going to be a benefit to us. It's always going to be a blessing. No one would ever say of an individual, you know, the, the problem that I have with brother so-and-so is he's just, um, I, he, you know, he's so loving. And that, that's really a problem I have with him. Or we don't go around and we don't say, you know, I, I appreciate it when I was sick, all those uh, cards and phone calls and visits that I got while I was, you know what? It's just, those people were just, I, they were just too loving. Uh, we don't reach a point where we as a people of faith, we don't reach a point where we say, you know, that's enough. I've, I've really had all the love that I can take. I'm, I'm full right now. Love is that good that we never have it to the extent that we don't need it. Love is that good. And I'd like to suggest to you tonight that when it comes to our relationship with God, love in that aspect is good as well. That there's never enough. That we don't reach a moment when we say, okay, I think God has loved me enough and now he doesn't have to love me anymore. I'm full on the love of God. We don't reach that point where we begin to push away and say that the thing that's, that's pushing me away from God is he just won't stop loving me. That's not who we are. We come to desire and want that type of love. We are told, and this is here in 1 John 4, we are told about God's love and what God's love does to us as individuals. We see how God's love is true, and because we understand God's love, it has an impact on those around us. John says it this way. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now, he's going to make the connection between God and them. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This is the connection that's being made between love and God. He says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. There's a, a difficulty that we have in being a people who are loveless and then turning around and saying, yeah, I get God. I, I, I get him. I, I understand him. But you don't because you're not grasping the concept of what, what love is. An unselfish type of love. A love that puts you first. A love that says you're the most important thing. 
A love that says, I would do anything that I possibly can for you. If we don't even understand the very concept of love, then we're not grasping who God is. He goes on and he says, In this the love of God was manifested. Verse 9. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. It's that manifestation of God's love. It's the medium of God's love. He says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There needed to be atonement. There needed to be the way to pay that penalty. There needed to be a way in which we can be reconciled to God because we had drifted, we had sinned, we had fallen short of all that God would have us be. And Jesus is the one that closes that gap. He becomes the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. When we understand the love that God has for us, it makes it possible for us to love one another. When we're not grasping that, then how can I love you? Think about it. How, how can I love you? It makes it very difficult, doesn't it? I want to I share with you some, some, some attributes tonight that speak specifically to the love that God has for each and every one of us. I, I don't think um, any of these verses are going to come as a surprise to you. I think they're all familiar to you, and I think that's good because we're getting an understanding of what love is, and, and we have all these things. Um, but I think this gives us a basis for coming to understand the greatness of God and His desire for us. First thing I want to do is I want us to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want us to look at what the Apostle Paul says as love, so we can have this when we're talking about God, we can have this as our, our working definition. And Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, says this, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, it is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love in its purity. Love in its simplicity. I'll suggest to you, if you look at the words that Paul is saying there, that they give us that foundation for understanding who God is as that pure example to us of love. Well, how is it manifested to, to us? Well, here's some suggestions. Here's the first one. When we talk about attributes of God's love, the first thing we see that it is a forgiving love. It is a forgiving love. Go over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And I want to give you, it's a, it's a larger context, but I want to highlight verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, there's, there's something that we have to do on our part. John is writing to Christians. He's not writing to non-Christians. And so John says, if we confess our sins, we as Christians, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The love of God is a cleansing love. It is a forgiving love. It is a love that is willing to say, I understand the wrong that has been done, but I've provided the remedy. You see? I've provided, I've, re, I've provided the avenue in which our love can be restored. You see this forgiving love in several different passages. Go back in your Bible to Acts chapter 2 and go down beginning there in verse 37 and notice the question that the Jews are asking. Now when they heard this, that, that, that first gospel sermon that Peter preached, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It, re, it reached them to the core 
and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In the response that's going to be given, they have to be told something. There has to be some type of response. They're asking a question. It's not like Peter's going to say, I'll get back to you later on that. Let me think about it. Let me kick it around a little bit. There's got to be an answer. But before we get back to that, I want you to notice that in that answer, love is present. Forgiveness is present. And it says there in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The remission of your sins. God is a loving God in which he provides forgiveness to us. Now, I understand that there are times when we always don't think we need it. I get it. We become puffed up and haughty. We begin to focus on self. We begin to get a, a little agitated about all this stuff that I need to do this and I need to live this way. And I, I understand there's times when we kind of, we get ruffled when it comes to the love of God. I understand that. But we need God's love in a forgiving sense. We need it in a way in which we can relate to and understand that because God has loved us, he gives us this forgiveness. Over in Acts chapter 22, the apostle Paul, as he is recounting his conversion experience, in verse, in verse 16 says this, Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Ananias says to him, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If God didn't love us, I'm, I mean that, that intimate, personal love, then why would he forgive us? If God didn't love us, why would he provide a way through the blood of Jesus Christ for us to be individuals who could know that our sins were forgiven, to know that we've been reconciled back to God? If he didn't love us, that wouldn't be there. But his love is this forgiving type of love. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. You're in Acts. Turn forward. Ephesians chapter 4. And notice the last verse, verse 32. It says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The very, um, how do I, uh, let, let, me, let me make sure I say it right. The very essence of God's love is rooted in the cross of Christ. And how that cross and the shedding of the blood of Jesus provides us the remission of, our, of the sins that we need, which is a demonstration to us that God loves us. Do you see how I got from A to B? It's, it's who God is as a loving God. He's this forgiving God. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and notice these words in verse 13. Paul says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. God's love is a forgiving love. Secondly, God's love at times must be a chastening love. It must be a love where God says, you know, there's limits. And the limits aren't set there because you know, I, I don't want you to enjoy life. The limits are set there because life isn't always good for you. The things that are contained in life, the things that we do in life, the things that we get involved in life. So God says, I'm, I'm going to set some limits. And when you, when you, when you cross those limits... There's a consequence. Now, I don't see how that would be hard for us to understand this chastening type of love that God has for us when we have the same type of love for our children. It's a chastening love. Be because I loved my children, when they went to grab the hot stove, I, I swatted their hand away. You think they enjoyed it? No. You think it was pleasant? No. You think sometimes they cried? Sure they did. But it was a chastening love. Don't do that. That's not good for you. That's only going to cause you a problem. That's God's love. That chastening love. Don't do that. It's not going to be good for you. 
No, notice how this is said over in Hebrews chapter 12. Turn forward, you're in Colossians. Turn forward to Hebrews chapter 12. And notice beginning in verse 5. I, I love the way the author puts it all together. He says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. This is a relationship, brethren. Sons. Speaks to you as sons. Family. Okay? And you've forgotten that exhortation. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. He goes on and he begins to put it together for us in, in another way that we can understand. He says, if you endure chastening, which is a sign of God's love, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? It's a question for you to think about an answer. Well, of course, all parents would chasten their children if they love them. He says, but if you are without chastening, the context is God's love. If you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You're not in the family. You're on the outside. That's pretty... I think that's pretty important to understand. God's love is seen in this relationship that he has with us. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but he, that's God, but God for our profit, our benefit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields, it produces. You yield a crop, it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Trained by what? Chastening. What is chastening based in? Love. What is an aspect or an attribute of God's love? Correction. And I agree with, with the author of Hebrews when he says, it didn't always seem pleasant. It doesn't always seem pleasant when God chastens us, does it? I, I want you to notice, uh, turn forward in your Bible to the last book, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And I, I want you to notice verse 19. Jesus is, is writing to the seven churches, giving them instruction. And he says this in the context of love. In the context of love. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. There's the end result of God's chastening love. Repent. There's the end result of why God has to chasten us. Because there has to be that time when we begin to turn away from those things that we know are wrong. And we turn back to God so that we don't have that relationship with Him hindered to the point where we drift further and further and further onto the fringe of having a relationship with God. God's love is a chastening love. Here's another suggestion that I'll give to you. God's love is long-suffering. We say three strikes and you're out, don't we? We say, if you hurt me once, then I'm not going to give you another opportunity to hurt me twice. We're, we're not always known as a creation, as being that abiding attribute within us of long-suffering. We cut people off. Put them out of our life. That's not the type of love that God has for us. I like the term long-suffering, but just for some reason in, in, in my mind, 
I always think when I think of long suffering, I think of enduring. It's just how my mind works that God's love is an enduring love. It hangs in there, it stays in there, it doesn't give up, it doesn't quit. It's long suffering. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. You're in Revelation. You have to turn backward in your Bible. Just a couple books. 2 Peter chapter 3. And notice in verse 9 these words, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Why? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the rest of the verse, but I'm going to suggest to you and put this little seed thought in your mind that the rest of the verse is going to have something to do with love. He says that, is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering in His love so that we will be a people that repent. God is long-suffering in His love so that we'll be a people who will reach that moment. The time will come. The day will arrive. The hour will be here. The second will tick away. And we say, it's been me, God. It's been me. I've been the one that's been wrong. I've been the one that's wayward. I've been the one that's working against you, not for you and with you. It's all come down to me. And so he hangs in there till we reach that point. He doesn't give up and say, well, you know, you asked me to forgive you two weeks ago for the same thing that you were dealing with, and now here you are before me again. Listen, I, 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 I can't keep doing this. Enduring. Long suffering. Go over. Turn back to your to your Old Testament. And turn back to the eighty sixth Psalm. Psalm eighty six. And notice verse fifteen. But you, O Lord are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. I need the long-suffering mercy of God. I pray about it. God, be merciful to me. God, hang in there with me. God, don't quit on me. Don't, don't leave me. Don't, don't stop giving me those things that, that only you can do. God, be merciful to me. And the mercy of God is the love of God. And the love of God is the long-suffering nature of God. Don't we sing a song? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God's love is new every morning because it is long-suffering for us, not giving up on us, not turning His back on us. He hangs in there with us. Here's another suggestion. We talk about the attributes of God's love. God's love is a self-sacrificing love. A self-sacrificing. He gives um, of Himself. The, the creator of all is willing to say, I, I'll do something. The creator of all could have said, well, listen, when it comes down to it, I, I'm just going to make you have to do absolutely everything, and nothing is going to be done on my part. That's not true. Certainly when it comes to the love of God, it's a self-sacrificing love. I'm going to give something of myself. I'm going to make that sacrifice of myself. And you see this in places like, like John chapter 3, one of those familiar verses to us. John chapter 3, beginning there in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Here's the sacrifice. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave Christ. God gave his son. self sacrifice it could have been there's no hope for you. One strike and you're out. One strike and, and you're, you're done. Everybody gets the choice of Eve. Everybody gets that one choice in their life to either obey me or disobey me. And after that, that's it. That could have been the pattern. But it's not. Why? 
Because of love. Because of the love that God has for us. Go, go over to, uh, stay there in the, the book of John. Go over to chapter 15. And notice beginning there in verse 13. Jesus is the one who's speaking. And he's giving them an object lesson. Um, how do I say? He's, he's giving them something that they can mentally see and understand. Okay? Putting it in a way in which they can visualize it. And he says, greater love, the greatest love, the most love, abundant love, superior love. Okay? Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's, I'll, I'll give you 14, but that's sacrifice. That's sacrifice. Greater love has no one more than this, that a man is willing to say, I'll do it. I, I'll be the one who will step out. I'll be the one who's willing to sacrifice. Somebody's got to do it. There has to be some type of sacrifice. A penalty has to be paid. And here's Jesus is saying, listen, this is the greater love that a man do this for his friends. Well, verse 13 wouldn't make much sense or the context wouldn't be known who he's talking about if you didn't see verse 14. You are my friends. Remember? Then to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You manifest your friendship through your obedience. You manifest that you want this relationship with me through your obedience. Who are you? You're my friends. And what is a great love? That I would lay down my life for my friends. It's a self-sacrificing love. Here's another one. God's love is a saving love. It kind of goes hand in hand that what we talked about when we talked about that forgiving type of love. But I wanted to separate it by several points. And look at the fact that God's love is a saving love. A clear, a clear demonstration of his saving love is seen in Romans chapter 5. If you turn over there, you're in John, turn forward. Go over to Romans chapter 5, and I want to begin in verse 6. Uh, verse 8, I think, is where the emphasis is, but let's back up to verse 6 to get the, the larger context. It says, For when we were still without strength, when we were sinners, right? When we weren't living as a people of faith. For when we were still without strength, in due time, when it was right, when it was necessary, when God determined that the time had come, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There had to be that moment in time in which God said, now is it. Now is the day. Now is the time. In, in, in my plan of the scheme of redemption, this is the moment in time when the cross occurs. This is the moment in time when the eternal blood is shed. Christ goes to the cross. And his blood leads to your forgiveness. He, he says this, In due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God, verse 8, demonstrates. He puts it in a way that you can... We were, uh, we were at, at HEB on Saturday doing some grocery shopping. And is, as you walk through the store, they have these little... Uh, booths that are set up and they have food product that's a demonstration let me show you how good this food is taste it let me show you how you're going to and you're going to enjoy this here here's, here's a sample I, I think you're really going to like this it's a it's a demonstration of a product paul is saying to the romans there's a demonstration and it's a very specific demonstration. And he says this, but God demonstrates his own love. We're talking about the attributes of God's love. 
that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You, you see it, right? You see the demonstration, right? You don't have the love of God without the cross of Christ. They're joined. He says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, the blood of Jesus, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, it gets better. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have been brought back by the blood of Jesus Christ to that relationship with God. God didn't leave. Man did. There is a theology in the denominations that reversed that, in which they say that God was reconciled to man. Why? Where did God go? When did God depart? When did God back away and say, I don't want a relationship with my creation? God didn't go anywhere. Man did. And now through the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, through the love of God, we've been reconciled. We've been brought back to God. He's a God that provides this saving love. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and notice verse 15. This is a faithful saying. That's the way of saying this is true. It's true. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Paul, in his reasoning... Paul in his wonderful intellect. Paul is willing to stand before the, the, uh, Timothy and say to him, listen, I feel like I'm the wretched man. I feel like I'm the man who's, who's done it. I feel like I'm the man who's not worthy of the love of God. I, I feel like I'm the worst of the worst. And if God can love me, then why can't God love everyone? Well, he can. And it's a saving love. One more. One more. When we talk about the attributes of God's love, we come to see that it's an eternal love. How long will God love me? I mean, am I going to wake up one morning and find out that God has said, that's enough. I mean, I... I, I hung in there with you for a long time. But there's a, um, an expiration date on how long I'm going to love you. Is that God? It's an eternal love. Go, go you're in 1 Timothy. Turn back to the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 8. And beginning there in verse 37, notice these words. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're victorious. We're winners. Think about it that way. For in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God says, I ain't going anywhere. I'm not limiting anything. Can I be... Can I be blunt? Can I, can I be blunt with you? If, if you wake up in the morning, just hang in there with me. 
If you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, and you're wrestling with all the things that you've done, you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, well, I don't know if God still loves me. The problem's with you. The problem's not with God and how it's being processed and how it's being understood and the reasoning that we're taking away from what the Scriptures say. God's love is an eternal love. It will never end. It won't reach the expiration date. It won't reach a moment when God says, okay, I've done all I can. That's all that I have to offer. And now everything, we're not going to go to the well of God's mercy and find out one day, oh, it's, it's run dry. There's, there's nothing more for us. Jeremiah says it this way. Turn back to your Old Testament. And I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And notice verse 3. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That love that God has for the nation of Israel, it's been this eternal love. It's been that long suffering, that, that loving kindness, and, and, I, and it's drawn you to me. Now, if that was true for them, wouldn't it be true for us? Well, sure it would be. Nowhere in the Scriptures does it say, well, God's going to be long-suffering in His love and eternal in His love to the nation of Israel, but when the Gentiles come into the church, I'm, I'm sorry, there's, there's, you know, there's a quota that's already been met. The same thing is, that is said in Jeremiah is true for us. An everlasting love. God's love, kind of process it this way, God's love is what motivates us to be the people that we need to be. Because love does that. When Alicia says to me, when I'm walking out the door in, in the morning, and she says to me, I love you, that has an impact on me. That means something to me. It produces a feeling within me. I'm loved. I'm special. I'm important. Somebody is saying to me that there is a relationship that exists. That's how we ought to feel because God has says it. I love you. I love you. I love you. We ought to feel a special way. That's, that's my God. That's the God who created everything. That's the God who has delivered people here and there and done this. That's the God that provided this. That's the God that allowed this to happen. That's the God that has achieved. And that God is saying to me, I love you. You know, you tell me how that can't produce a feeling in us. We can't let that grow cold. We certainly can't let it grow old. Is new every morning. It ought to be. So I'm working on the lesson this week and I'm coming up with, you know, I gotta I, I gotta well, I gotta tell them I gotta have a conclusion. I gotta I gotta end it somehow. And I I I, I, I put down some uh, some scripture verses and I said, yeah, you know, maybe I can put that in there, and make that I mean I I gotta conclude it. And I thought, what's the best way to conclude it? And I, I came up with this conclusion. And forgive me if it's too simple. How, how do you conclude a sermon on the attributes of God's love? I think you conclude it this way. Listen. God loves you. If we can help you tonight, if we can encourage you tonight, we'd like to do that. If you are in need of prayer, we are a praying church. We believe in the providence of God working through prayer. And if we can pray for you, we would love to do that. If you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, the love of God, the blood of Jesus Christ is waiting for you. 
We would love for you to reach that point where you understand and know the gospel plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. And if you are there at that moment or you want to study more, would you give us that opportunity? If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?